Yeah, I'm so excited, man. It's, yeah, it's like Holy Week. It's the greatest time of the year for us as believers to celebrate what Jesus did for us all those years ago and what he continues to do for us. Today is Palm Sunday, which again is the, op- is the moment that Jesus had his triumphant entrance into Jerusalem. This, this moment where people were celebrating Jesus before they knew what he was about to do. They were celebrating Jesus, celebrating something that they didn't even know. They thought they were celebrating his way to the throne, but they didn't realize they were celebrating his way to the tomb. And they didn't realize that. I think for all of us, you know, we live on this side of the resurrection. We live on this side of that moment. But they didn't, they didn't understand what was about to happen. They didn't understand what they were celebrating. They were so excited. I think a crowd formed and they were like, yeah, he's here. And they all started celebrating together. But then they also didn't realize what was about to happen because moments, a few days later, they were telling everyone to kill him and send him to die. The same people. This day, Palm Sunday. And there's this moment when we look at Palm Sunday, people didn't realize the grief and loss that they were about to experience especially those closest to Jesus, they didn't realize the grief that they were going to experience in just a few days and the loss. And there's this moment when I was a kid, me and my family, we used to go on these long trips. These, we drive, we, one time we literally drove from our house in Cochrane, Alberta. We drove all the way down through Texas into Mexico. And we, and we had our van and our big, I think it was like a 93 like Dodge Caravan or something. And we're driving, and, and then when, when, in those days, we had something called uh, a VHS player in our, in our van. Now, you guys who don't know what a VHS is, it's a tape. And if you don't know what a tape is, just like Google it. Like, uh, you can Google what a tape is, and it'll tell you what a tape is. But this VHS player, we had literally like a 10-inch screen, maybe 12-inch screen, that would go in between my parents' seats in the front, and we would watch movies all the time. We would just watch movies because, again, we were driving. We'd be gone for seven weeks out of the summer driving. We'd, we'd drive through California, through the northern states, through all the way down into Mexico. And we'd, we'd always watch movies. And when there's this one time, we were driving, and we ended up, t- we needed to take a rest stop by Banff, Alberta in the mountains. So we said, okay, take this rest stop. So we stop, we go out, and then when we come back in, we take off, we start driving. We have our trailer, we have our van, we're driving. And then me and my sister, and we decided, you know what we want to do? I have a brother too, so there's three of us, me, my brother, my sister. And me and my sister decided, you know what, we should watch a movie. And so, of course, I don't know if you guys have ever had two kids try and decide something before. It's very difficult. And so we're discussing it, arguing it, but then my brother is silent. So we're like, hey, bro, like, what do you want to watch? Silence. And then, because he used to sit in the very back of our van with a massive duvet, right, to be comfortable. So it's there, and all of a sudden, we peel back the duvet. He's not in the van. My brother. And so my parents, like, I know some of us are parents. A lot of us are parents. I'm a new parent. Can you imagine the agony and the loss and the grief you would feel leaving your maybe 10-year-old son in the middle on the side of the road in the mountains? That's where my parents found themselves, pulling a trailer, trying to turn around in the mountains. So they find a spot, they turn around. I, I don't remember the panic because I probably thought it was funny. Um, just because I'm, like, I'm his younger brother. It's hilarious to me, right? You left him, haha, <laughs> got him so good, right? Um, but we leave him and we go back and there's my brother. He's just standing there on the side of the road, right where we left him, waiting for our return. He's just standing there around all these tourists, just waiting. People are trying to talk to him in other languages. He doesn't barely speak English, right? And he's trying to, they're trying to talk to him and they can't understand. And then we get him back in the car. My parents finally have this relief of, wow, we found our son and we headed off the rest of our way. And again, I'm a, I'm a new parent, but I can only imagine the, the grief that I would feel or the agony and the loss that I would feel if I left my daughter, who's eight months old, on the side of the road. <laughs> Probably a worse situation, uh, but I, if I left her, like the f- grief that I would feel and the loss that I would feel in that moment. And I think for a lot of us, that's what this year has been. I think for a lot of us, this year has been a year of grief and loss. You know, we're, we're over one year into a two-week lockdown. We're over a year in. I remember, I, I, I'm looking on my Facebook feed, and I'm seeing memory after memory after memory of all the panic that was going on one year ago. 
I remember uh, I watched this video of when the NBA, I don't know if you remember when the NBA shut down. There, there was a game that was about to happen, and before it happened, the announcer went on and said, hey guys, it's time to leave the building. There's, there, we're, there, there's, there's nothing going on. You just need to leave. There is a lot of people who are panicking because they thought there may have been a bomb threat going on. There may have been an active shooter in the area. No, they were shutting down the entire NBA. And then the NHL shut down, and things just kept shutting down. Everything kept getting canceled and getting changed. And I remember just having that moment a year ago, thinking like, what is going on in our world? And I think a year later, we're still asking that same question. But at the time, we, no one knew what was happening. This was the first time in most of our lives that we had experienced and have experienced something like this. The amount of loss and grief that I think we've gone through this year is higher than I think we even realize. You know, for my wife and I, we had this vacation plan. We were supposed to go to Phoenix, Arizona about a year ago today, right after Easter, and that got canceled. You know, and this year, my wife and I, we, we had our first baby, eight months old. You know, and when we, when we planned to have children, this was not the year that we planned to have children in. We didn't, we didn't plan to have children in a moment when we couldn't even celebrate her with the rest of my family or our family. We, we, didn't, we didn't plan to have, to have a child where every time they go out in public, they can't see people smiling. But we didn't, we didn't plan for this. And there's a lot of loss and I think a lot of grief that a lot of us have gone through this year. And then for us to even realize that we're, as a church, we're in the middle of a massive change. We're in the middle of a massive transition. We're, at, we're, we're going from a pastor who's been with us for 14 years to somebody brand new. And I know for a lot of us that that does bring mo uh, emotions of loss and grief. I think that's just the reality. Even if a transition, even if a change is good, we still experience grief. You know, that's where we are as a church. You know, and today I've called my talk, now what? Now what do we do? You know, we're a year into this pandemic. We're a week into a transition with our pastor leaving. Now what? And, I, and there's this moment in the scriptures that I think shares the answer to this question. And it's actually after Jesus's death. It's after um, Jesus has died and the disciples, they don't know what to do. You can imagine they've been with this man for three years. The guy that they thought would lead them ended up leaving them. The man that they thought would save them ended up being sent to a grave. And they're sitting there and one of their, one of their friends has just killed himself. And they're sitting there. They, they do not know what to do. And we can pick up the story in John chapter 20, verse 19. It says this. It says, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid. They were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. And they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And again, he said, peace be with you as the father has sent me. So I am sending you. And I think when it comes to dealing with this question, now what? I think the first thing that we need to do as individuals is do a diagnosis. We need to have a diagnosis. Number one, we have to have a diagnosis of how am I actually doing? How are we actually feeling in this moment? One year in, one week into transition, how are we feeling? I think a lot of us this year, I think, has flown by, at least for me. I feel like this year has gone so fast that I don't even know if I've had any time to actually reflect on this past year. You know, maybe some of you have spent moments reflecting on some of the things, but I think there's a lot that we still need to deal with. I think there's a lot of loss and a lot of grief that we still need to walk through that we haven't even had a moment to because everything's happening so fast, we don't even feel like we have time. We need to do a diagnosis. The disciples, right, they're sitting after their, their friend has died and they're sitting there saying, what do we do? They're in the room. They've locked the door. They're terrified. They're petrified. It says they're afraid of the Jewish leaders. They're afraid that they're going to be next. They're afraid that they're going to be the next ones who die. They're sitting there in fear in this room. They don't know what to do. Their whole world had changed. Their whole life had changed. What they had dedicated their lives to for years, for three years, everything was different. The guy that they thought would save them wasn't there anymore. 
You know, they were in a season in themselves, in a season of transition. They were transitioning from what they knew to what they didn't know. And I think a lot of the time grief is that. It's that we don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know. You know, we don't know what the future is going to look like here in Alberta. We don't know what the future is going to look like in Canada. You know, if we watch the news, we really don't know what's going to happen. And we just sit here and we, we don't know what to do. And I think a lot of us, I don't think a lot of us were, were afraid of disease. I think we're afraid of what's going to happen next. I don't think we're afraid of getting sick. A lot of us, some of us, maybe we're a little afraid of getting sick. But I think a lot of us, we're afraid because we're grieving so hard of what we used to know. To think that most of us this, this Easter, we're not going to be able to spend time with our family. We're not going to be able to eat a meal with our friends. The fact that Christmas, we weren't able to do that. The fact that last Easter, we weren't able to do that. This year, I think, has been challenging for all of us. And we need to do this diagnosis that, that how am I actually doing? And I want you to know, if you're feeling, if you're in this room or you're watching us online, if you're feeling grief and loss right now, I want you to know you're not the only one. You're not the only one experiencing this right now. I think all of us are experiencing this in a different, unique way. It's been difficult for some of us. Some of us this year, we've lost our business. Some of us this year, we've lost our job. Some of us this year, we've lost people to sickness. You know, some of us this year, we lost vacations. We lost our graduation. We lost sports. We lost our final year of high school. And for all of us, it's been different. For some of us, it's been good. Some of us, maybe this year has been beneficial and good for you. But I want everyone to know that if you're in this moment and you're even thinking a week from Pastor Jonathan leaving, you're experiencing loss, I want you to know that that's, that's a normal feeling. It's not abnormal for you to be feeling loss right now. You know, and the disciples, they found themselves in this room. And they were diagnosing where they're at, right? Like, they were terrified. They didn't know, they didn't have a clue what to do. And I think a lot of us, we feel in the same situation. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to do with where we are at because loss is hard and loss is real. And the question is, how are you really doing? If it's just you and me in the room, how are you really doing right now in this moment? How are you really doing? You know, and after we have this diagnosis, I think the reality is, you know, if we ever go to the doctor, we go in and we have the, do the doctor, we diagnose, how are we doing? And then the doctor usually gives us the remedy. The doctor usually gives us the cure, the medicine, the surgery, whatever that we need to cure what we're feeling with. And we need to find the remedy. Because I love how the disciples, right? They're terrified. They're in the room. They're scared in the upper room. And they're, they don't know what to do. And Jesus shows up. I love it. It's locked, right? I think sometimes we lock ourselves in our fear. We lock ourselves in our grief. We lock ourselves in our loss. And we think nobody can get in. But I'm telling you, Jesus can still enter. Jesus will walk through a locked door for you. Jesus will walk through the locked door of your heart and say, here I am. I love you. And if we go, if we look at that story again, he walks through the door and he doesn't respond with judgment. Right? He doesn't respond like, hey, what are you guys doing? Why are you so afraid? Why are you so scared? He says what? He says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. And then he, what he does, he says, peace be with you. And then he shows them his scars. I think a lot of us, we try and hide our scars. We try and hide our pain. We try and hide our grief. We try and hide our loss. But the scars are a reminder of the victory. The scars that you have in your life, the things that you've gone through throughout your life, the scars that you have are not meant to be hidden. They're meant to be shown so we can see victory in other people's lives. Jesus says, hey, here I am. Look at the, look at the scars in my hands. Look at, the, look at the scar on my side. We won. We conquered death. I did it, and I did it for you. Peace be with you, he said. Peace be with you. He brings us peace. And there's this other moment a few, you know, earlier in Jesus' life where fear is present with his disciples. His disciples are terrified. And there's this moment. Jesus had been teaching to all these people, this big crowd. He's standing in a boat. He's teaching parable after parable after parable. And then it's time for them to go across the water. And so they get in the boat. And then this is what happens. 
Mark 4, verse 37, it says, And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. And I don't know if you all have ever been on a boat, but if I'm on a boat and the the boat is filling with water, that's not a good thing. Right? And these disciples, right, some of them were professional fishermen. It'd be like going to work and having something happen that you've seen over and over and over again and still being terrified. This is where the disciples find themselves. The boat was already filling. But Jesus, he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. I'm telling you that the peace that God uses to calm the storms around us, he will use to calm the storm within us. When we're dealing with grief, when we're dealing with loss, Jesus is the remedy for what we're desperately searching for. The the remedy for our pain, for our grief, for everything we walk through. Jesus is the remedy because he brings the peace that we desperately need in the moment. The disciples are afraid on a boat. Things are happening around them. They're afraid in a room based on what's happening within them. And Jesus brings them the same peace he brought to the storm he brought to their heart. And the interesting thing about the story, you know, they're in the upper room, they're afraid of the Jewish leaders. A lot of these men, the disciples died because of the Jewish leaders later in their life. So the peace that Jesus brought them in that moment, they had until their death. The peace that they desperately needed, they had until their death death and we need to realize this that when we're walking through pain when we're walking through hardship we need to know that Jesus wants to calm the storm within us sometimes we feel like he's sleeping I don't know if you ever prayed a prayer a desperate prayer and you don't feel like you hear a response we feel like our boat is sinking we feel like we're capsized we feel like we cannot even go on one more day one more moment one more hour we feel like we can't keep going And we feel like Jesus is sleeping. But I think the reality is that sometimes we need to realize that sometimes the storm is important. The storm is important. Dealing with the storm is important. Because Jesus will show up and he will calm that storm for you. Sometimes it takes longer than we hope. Sometimes the grief we feel lasts longer than we hope it would. But Jesus still enters the the room. He he gets up and he says, peace, be still. And our prayer is that all of us today will receive that peace. The peace that passes all understanding. Peace, be still. Throughout COVID, we've needed peace. Throughout this transition with Pastor Jonathan stepping out and us stepping in, we've needed peace. You know, for all of us. This has been a challenging year, a challenging moment, but Jesus is the remedy for a grieving heart. Jesus is the remedy for loss. Jesus is the cure. Jesus is the medicine. Jesus is what we need when we're feeling lost. He is the peace. Peace, be still. Peace, I leave with you. Peace. peace we need his peace when we're in this storm that we walk through and you know once we have this diagnosis right we step in we have this diagnosis of kind of where we're actually at and then we find the remedy the last thing i think we need to do is we need to fight you know if we go back to that to that verse at the at the beginning that, that we shared uh, verse john 20 verse 21 it said again he said peace be with you as the father has sent me so i am sending you Jesus is sending us to go into the world to fight. To fight. Because God is building his church. God is building his church. We need to fight. When somebody gets really sick, and I've had moments where people have gotten really sick. And what we always encourage people to do and what we do is we pray. We say, let's fight this together. Let's fight this disease together. We don't just give up and stand back. We step forward and say, let's fight. And the reality is we need to do the same thing for our world. We need to fight for our world. We need to fight for humanity. We need to fight for the salvation of people. We need to be fighting. We don't give up. We need to do the same when it comes to this. In Matthew 16, verse 18, this is one of my favorite verses. 
It says this, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I think, I think, I think we need to realize the power of this verse. I don't know if you've been, you know, when you were in high school or even recently, you've been hearing about like what happens when an immovable object meets an unstoppable force. That's right. Thank you. I don't know the answer to that question, but one thing I do know is that the church is an unstoppable force. And the gates of hell is a movable object. And we have the power to go and fight, to step up. And how we fight, what our weapon is, our weapon is not anything we have. It's what God is speaking. Our weapon is the word of God. And we step into the future by fighting with what God is speaking, not by, by, by what we think. The world does not need more opinions. If we go on Facebook, we watch the news, it's opinion after opinion after opinion. We don't need more opinions. What we need is truth. And where do we find truth? By reading his word. And that's how we fight. If we want to see, because the gates of hell are standing there and we are, we are an unstoppable force, the church, and we're fighting for a better future for humanity. We're an unstoppable force, the church. The gates of hell will not prevail because God is still moving. God is still working. God is unstoppable. And he's building something here at Victory Church on the Rock. He's building something here in Edmonton. He's building something here in Alberta. He's building something in Canada. He's building something in North America. And he's building something across this world. And when loss comes, we need to diagnose it. We need to find out that Jesus is the peace we're looking for. And we need to realize that we get to fight. We don't just sit back and let other people fight our battle. Jesus said, like the Father sent me, I am sending you. I am sending you, Victory Church on the Rock, to fight against what the devil is doing. And I'm excited. I'm excited for what God is going to do because our weapon is peace. Our weapon is God's word. God is building his, his church and he's asking us to partner with him in that. To fight for something more beautiful than we've ever seen. To fight, to fight for revival in, in Edmonton. To fight for Jesus to show up and bring peace our world desperately needs. To bring truth, not opinion. I'm sick of opinion. I need Jesus. We need Jesus more than ever as a nation, as a province, as a city. And I believe that God is going to do something beautiful through Victory Church on the Rock. We are excited for it. We're in this together. So let's build something beautiful together, Victory Church on the Rock, and say, you know what? The gates of hell will not prevail. Because we are a church fighting for, the human for salvation for humanity. We are a church who's stepping into the future saying, you know what? God is for us. Who can be against us? We don't battle against flesh and blood, but we fight against the principalities. And I know that God has something big for us as a church, as a nation, as a province, as a city. And we get to go into the future together. But I want to do everyone to do it this time as you stand with us. What we're going to do is we're going to sing one last song together. And this song is called, You Cannot Be Stopped. And as we sing this song, I want to declare this today as a church, that God cannot be stopped, His church cannot be stopped, which means we cannot be stopped when it comes to bringing salvation to the nations. So let's sing this song together.